Okay, as the moderator, I'm going to take the liberty of having this be the last question. However, I'm going to alter the format just slightly. I'm going to give each of the panelists two minutes to answer this question, and then we'll conclude. So the question is, you say, each say the first thing that must happen to achieve peace is for the other side to do something first, parens, end terrorism, or recognize the occupation. What could your own underline three times, side do better to move towards peace. And I'm going to modify it. What is the one thing that your own side could do better to move toward peace? And we'll start with Eric. Two minutes. We'd end with everybody having the chance to answer the question. <coughs> Well, this obviously is a personal opinion since that's what was asked. And it's my personal opinion that uh, what the Israelis can continue to do is to continue fostering and maintaining the peace movements which were very much in force prior to the launch of the most recent violence, keeping them active and alive and continue to strive for peace while the Israeli government continues to try to work towards establishing a level of security that its population can tolerate. When a horizon exists, or perhaps through the auspices of the U.S. government, which has been so kind in helping this process along for so many years, maybe can initiate another process that can help bring the sides together, then these forces will reemerge and will once again dominate the Israeli political scene as they have in the past. Unfortunately, under the circumstances that exist today, it's very difficult to imagine that happening. It's going to require, you know, again, all the four powers to again force not only the current truce to take hold but to enforce and uh, um, watch over it to make sure that both sides are adhering to it and I think once the confidence building is built back up through this process and I think there I think what I'm saying basically is that the current process that's in place that's being managed primarily by the United States and the federal and the gov our government here but also sponsored by the European powers Russia and the United Nations is probably the only process that has a hope of working and I think all of us need to support that process. And that means that they need to have the ability to be able to watch over and administrate and see that the both sides are going through the processes of building confidence in each other, are adhering to the agreements that have been established through the interim agreement and all the agreements, the Y agreement, Mitchell plan, everything in between, to make sure that as this confidence gets built back up, that once again, peace can be achieved. But until both sides can find a level of trust for each other, which does not exist today, I'm afraid that this plan is hopeless. That's a, an interesting question because what is my side? My side represents the non-aligned, for the most part, extremely negligent American public, 90% of our country probably, probably more, um, who, as I said, are not Muslim or Middle Eastern or Palestinian and are not Jewish and do not have relatives and emotional ties to Israel. We're the people that have done nothing except we have allowed our tax money to go and commit horrible crimes. We have not paid attention and those of us who have paid attention have been afraid quite often to speak out. We don't like being called names. We don't like being called anti-Semitic. We don't like having our jobs and our careers jeopardized when we speak on this issue. And so too many of us have remained silent. Too many of us have remained ignorant. And we have allowed this to go on. As I said, when you're looking for peace, when you're looking for negotiations, what you have to do are understanding, is to understand the power dynamics. Who has the power? When there is an enormity, enormous disparity in power, the weak side has one, one, one choice. There's nothing, what they can do is they can submit. That's what the Palestinian population can do. They can submit. They have no way to enact peace. The Israeli leadership feels that because they have a blank check from the American public, whenever they need more money, as they have recently, they come and they get another $10 billion from us. The peace activists in Israel also have no power 
because of this blank check from the American public to the militarists in Israel. So it's when the American public decides to wake up, to become informed, when we become informed to inform our neighbors, our friends, our relatives, our schools, our churches, our rotary clubs, when we inform others and when we speak out no longer afraid to speak, but when we honestly say we no longer will allow this to go on, not with our tax money, will this be done anymore. Then we will have peace. It's up to us. It's interesting. I guess I understood the question differently. There are two sides in the conflict, and I was hoping to hear an answer that would deal with what the Palestinian side needed to do. We didn't hear that. Uh, perhaps Dr. Bajan will be able to answer that one. Uh, my suggestion to Israel, which actually I've written to um, Prime Minister Sharon. He didn't write back, but I wrote it to him. Um, was very simple. You have to establish moral clarity. Israel is assailed, in some cases honestly, there are just and honest critiques of Israel. But in very many cases, much of what is said is completely false. Now, what you have to do as a country is establish moral clarity. If you want a policy which people will be able to support, you must enunciate it. You must tell people what you're doing and why you're doing it. And you must be open to criticism. Now, one of the interesting things about Israel is that it has been described as one of the most freewheeling democracies in the world. Absolutely. And the reason for that is because in Israel, anybody can make a public statement. Any author, any, um, what's it called, journalist, yes, can write whatever he wants or she wants about Israel, critical or not, and not have to worry about ending up in jail or being shot or being tortured to death. And this allows for a lot of free speech and a lot of critique. And it's incumbent upon the Israeli government to respond to that and to make its case. Now, if it does that, and it gains the support that it needs, then it in turn can support that emerging leadership that I described before, which sees the terrorists as the problem and wants to get rid of them. And then the Israeli government can help those Palestinian leaders get rid of the terrorism. That will bring peace. The question in terms of what the Palestinians' uh, perspective is in terms of bringing about peace. Uh, there's been a discussion about changing of Palestinian leadership and I am fully in support of changing of the Palestinian leadership. But, but, it might not be the leadership that he wants. It would be a democratic leadership. Uh, second, uh, my argument is the following. The Zionist logic has failed. Zionism... Uh, shut up! No, re respect her. She's used to that. Every vessel gives out which is in it. So let me continue the question and the answer. The Zionist logic has failed. For Zionism, it continues to make the game or the play that by marrying into power, wanting to be part of the empire, meaning in the US, that they could bring their logic and exist in Palestine for the longest period of time. We as Palestinians will, will they make the argument for the Zionists and the Jewish community, both here and the world, that your future is with relations with the Arab and Muslim world. Your future is not with depending of power because power is transitory. If you're depending on the continued relations with the United States, I would say that they will bargain you away if their interests shift and change. And therefore, this is the argument I will make with the Palestinians, that this a change in leadership, and then to make the argument that your history might not reflect the future in relations to the Arab and Muslim world. Just like the Ottomans opened their borders when the Inquisition took place, I think there's still that possibility 
even after the dispossession that you have done to the Palestinians, even that you have maligned and called us all kinds of names, we are still able to open our arms and accept having equality and a way for us to coexist. The challenge is that the right wing in Israel doesn't like this vision and that's where the change. Our problem is that the right wing in Israel, the extremists in Israel are in power while the Palestinians are the ones that are running in the streets and that's the logic and the discussion that we have to begin to undertake. Thank you. Could you give one final uh, round of applause for all of our speakers? Karen Kenny, Dean of Students. Yeah. Our organizers. Yes, we, we work. And give a round of applause to Imad for organizing all this. He's been, he's, in, uh, he's been doing this for the past two weeks. He's been going crazy. Give him a round of applause. Thank you. Our ushers, um, and, our ushers and Mr. Saleh, Lieutenant Saleh as well, please.